Another turn, Inquisitor. I ask again, Yovara Ixensios, do you confess to these heresies of which you stand accused? Do you confess to apostasy? I confess to renouncing a mistake. Do you confess to conspiracy against the one true faith? I confess to opening minds. Do you confess to false prophecy? I confess to following a false prophet. Indeed. And where might we find this heretic? He wears the robes of a Grand Inquisitor. You have no followers here, heretic. Your lies hold no sway in the court of the penitents. Only my truth, then. Another turn! No! Wait! Wait! I'm ready. I'm ready. You are ready to give a confession? I am ready to hear one from you. When you get to the bottom, holler up here. 
Let me know if it's safe. I think I dislocated my... That's better. Everyone all right? No shattered knees? Good. Just me, then. Looks like all my parts are still moving. Did anyone bring a ladder? So you knew this Theos character ages ago, that right? And that was what? A few hundred years ago? A thousand? What's that even like, remembering something from so long ago? Oh, I suspect you'll find your answers. Just brace yourself for when you do. <sighs> That's what's got me thinking about Theos. Those Delamgon said he remembers everything. I mean, can you imagine? Recalling centuries in perfect detail. Every lost love. Every failed dream. Whatever his mission, he's had a long time to work at it. You ever wonder how that's changed him? Whether Theos would have chosen this path all those lifetimes ago if he'd known where it would lead? Uh, if he's in leagues with Wodica, I wouldn't be so sure. I shouldn't expect you to have much sympathy for the man. What with the trouble he's caused you and so many others. Remind me to never get on your bad side. I'm not defending Theos. But I know what it's like to carry a burden you can't put down. Which makes me wonder why he's doing it. Other gods told you that he means to strengthen Wudika. But to what end? I suppose you're right. Found something.
You've come back. I had thought to have set you on the right path ages ago. Or did I merely fail a second time? You are so different now from who you were then, yet much remains the same. Old troubles with a new face. What is it that has brought you here? I'd hoped after our last discussion you would find what you sought. Has it eluded you all this time? I can only guess your presence here has something to do with Theos. The energy of this place changes when he is near. I don't know what he has done, but I do know of the souls that pass through here now. They do not come by choice. After all this time, he would still stand against the tide. I will tell you what I remember. I can see his influence, still hanging like a weight about your neck. So it always was. He had inspired something in you. We spoke of him the last time you were here also. It was just after the trial. You were agitated. I think because you started to consider that what I was teaching may have been true. That the gods aren't real. She's not serious. <laughs> Perhaps not to her. Many are those whom the gods have scorned. This is petty retribution. That doesn't seem possible. What I taught was that the gods whose faith we had been spreading were not gods at all, but something else entirely. Something created by people. They were conceived by Engwith, a society of high minds and broad concerns. Theos' people. In their time, every people worshipped its own gods. Sometimes they warred over it. After a few wars of their own, the Engwithans sought an end to it. They devoted all their energy to finding the true creators. Generation after generation, they prodded and worked the stitching of the world and unlocked its secrets. One day, they found an answer. Except the answer was no answer at all. There were no gods to be found. Or if there ever were, they were gone. It shook them, this finding. If they could discover this on their own, how long until others would? How long before war and chaos reigned over a world without consequence? But they had mastered many things in their pursuit of these answers. And with their mastery, they crafted their own gods to fill the void, and sent missionaries to the corners of the world to spread their faith. I never thought of it as faith, but I think you are right to call it that. Let the world see. Let them decide what to do. That was my faith. I became a missionary because the gods brought me hope that I wanted to bring to others. For a time, the truth sent me to a dark place. Then the day came when I realized nothing had changed, that I still had a purpose, and the purpose was the same and it was worth living for. I began questioning the other missionaries in public, exposing their parlor tricks. In time, their following became mine. The Anguithan missionaries all knew it, but they never told the rest of us. They meant it to be a secret that died with them, and in the end, they allowed their bloodlines to fade from memory. I had been assigned to join a few of them at a temple. I found the door to their chambers closed, but the room was stone and the door thin. Their voices carried. I heard... enough. I investigated the things they spoke of, and everything was there, just as they said it be. You asked me this once before. 
Nothing I can say would be any proof, and it may be certainty your soul craves. Resolution. But if you are bound for the same place Theos directs these souls, you will see for yourself as you once did. Everyone faces this truth at one time or another. Few confront it. Few have the stomach to ask what if. And in avoiding the question, they deny themselves an identity of their own. What if all the tragedy, all the persecution, came in defense of an imposter? That's not... That, that can't be right. Aethys, he... He's done miracles for people. The power of the gods is undeniable. The truth of the story they weave is not. What if it were forbidden knowledge rather than fault that earned your doom? What of your guilt? I have seen with my own eyes the deceptions of my goddess. The Watcher has shown me as much. But it was not until now that I understood how truly desperate she was. The depths of her deception. You speak of her deceptions, but what of your own? Was it her words that led you down your path? Or was it the absence of her words? A gap that you filled with your own broken thoughts. What if our burdens come to us not because they are meant to be, but because they happen to be? They shape us all the same. It doesn't matter how I drew the small tooth, or even that Pursok had become a deer. The task fell to me and I completed it. What if your body is destined to outlive your purpose? And keep me caged up? Like you? I ain't gonna let my soul go to rot in this thing. You may have little choice in the matter, but as to your purpose, that choice is yours. What if no god had the authority to relieve our burdens or absolve our sins? No, then I guess we'd have to seek those things from people. And that's the hard part, isn't it? It's easy to close your eyes and pray to a god. Harder to open them and look into the face of someone you've hurt. Or someone who's hurt you. I spent a long time looking for a miraculous solution. But you can't undo the past any more than you can unspill a glass of wine. All you can do is move forward and try for better. Many are the names of those who have died in despair, waiting for the help of the gods. It's the Trials Watcher that make us what we are. Have I not always said so? Yet strength is not given, but earned and always in proportion to its cost. What will you sacrifice for yours, and who will pay the toll? I ask these things not to trouble you, but to show why they must be confronted. No answer is simple, but somewhere between them all lies a truth so beautiful, not even a god could conceive it. Do we not owe ourselves a chance to find our part in it? If that is truly what you believe, then you are a far different person than the one I knew. I've been alone here with my thoughts for so long now. I've found peace with my failures and with my punishment. I no longer curse fate for what might have been. But there is one thing that has clawed and scraped at my mind all these years. One thing that will not be put to rest until I know. Until I understand. I need to know why you chose to remain with the Inquisition, even after you'd learned the truth. Do you... Do you remember? I never wanted that. I had hoped that what I taught would replace your beliefs with something that made you stronger. For many it did. But not all, it seems.
We knew little of each other before you arrived at my camp. You might have been anybody. Which is why your choice meant everything. You had heard both sides, seen everything. If not you, then who? I expected dissent, but I needed to know that true faith would prevail. Perhaps I've been wrong to place so much importance on one person's actions. It was all I could do to feel like there was an answer. Even knowing what you've told me, some part of me knows it doesn't truly answer what I wished to know. Nor will an eternity of silent contemplation. I will have only my guesses and suspicions, and that will have to do. And what of your understanding of our past? Are you at ease with the choice you made? At first I thought this might be the source of your soul's anguish. But now I see I was mistaken. You are not divided on this matter. You have put it behind you. It is with Theos that your agony lies, in sun and shadow. Your questions are not for me, but for him. And it may be that only an answer from the mouth of Theos himself will satisfy your needs. Yet if there is anything I can tell you that would be of use, ask and you shall know. In a matter of speaking, this is Brayeth Yamin, the court of the penitents. Souls are confined here until they repent. They must beg the forgiveness of a god, pledge their soul to them, and they will be lifted from this place to the world above. In truth, they receive leniency, but not true mercy. The spite of Wittica is eternal. They linger above, at the side of the old court, and are not permitted to leave the island, forever severed from the cycle. This prison was full once in the days of the Inquisition, but time weathers all things, even will. I'm the only tenant who remains. Yet, I feel their presence strongly now, as it was in the beginning. You have brought many of them here. They cry out for the judgment of Theos. You have struck some bargain with the gods, then. They aid you because they would bend you to their own purposes. Angwith built gods from ideals, and an ideal on its own is a grotesque and vicious thing. But these souls, these forgiven the gods have bequeathed you like chattel. They were loyal followers in life. They will be with you to the very end. Last time someone asked me that. I was bound to an iron wheel with a broken spine. There are many things I've come to doubt about the choices I made in life. But that trial was my one moment of certainty. Even without a chorus of gods to tell me I had been right. The gods need to be reminded that we have a spirit, and that spirit is proof against their power. They have the power to manipulate and confuse and ruin us but not to change our will. I will remain here until the world crumbles and fades from existence with joy in my heart, knowing I've shown them what they truly are. I could not say for sure, but you have been to Sun and Shadow before, and it came at a crossroads in your life, when much of what you knew had been upended. I have to believe it will come to you there. Your concerns then were of loyalty and trust and the gods. Everything I told you seemed to send you further into doubt. His words mattered to you when you knew him then. After you and I spoke, you went immediately to seek him out. Perhaps you simply sought confirmation from the man you trusted. If something from that time still troubles you, it may be something he told you then, or refused to tell you. He keeps secrets better than any in this world. He cares only for the secret he keeps locked away, 
He destroys anyone who might discover it, no matter their chances. That's why he's always favored Woodica. It isn't in her love of promises or justice. It's her disregard for the rules. Her willingness to do what is necessary. To Theos, she's not a deity, but an ally with which to conspire. When her power waxes, she does as she pleases with this realm, as well as hers. And she wants that secret guarded as much as he. If Theos succeeds, there will be a shift in the balance of power among the gods. Woodica was vanquished once when the other gods decided she had gone too far and her power diminished. With this infusion, there is no telling what she will do. The only certainty is that there will be chaos in their realm, as well as ours. You will not find a more resolute being on all of Eora. There is no offer you could make, nor spell you could cast, nor pain you could inflict that would make him reveal what he hides. But I see you have become a watcher in this life. Perhaps in defeat, when he can no longer defend himself, you might learn something from him. Theos will not wait for you. If you do not catch up to him now, you may never find him again. Your soul deserves an end to its suffering. I'm sorry I wasn't able to grant it myself. May it come to you swiftly. If ever we should meet again, in this life or any other, I hope to find you at peace. Doesn't that just beat all? Here I was, wondering all this time whether all these terrible things were people's fault or the gods. Turns out they might be the same thing. Wonder how things would have gone different 15 years ago if the Raid Sarens had been told their god was made in some forge or kiln someplace. Would we still have gone to war? I could see the rebellion still happening, but I don't know that they would have invaded. I don't know. When Woden left for war, we, uh, had a fight. As brothers will. About him going off to war. He was set on it. But my parents warned him. They said you get a new country with every trip across the border, but your god, you only get the one. But me? I didn't know who was right. All I knew was I didn't want him to go. It's the same for families as it is for gods. You only get the one. I said every vicious thing I could think of, trying to change his mind. He brushed it off. Just got me madder, of course, him being so calm. He said I should come with him, but he'd understand if I didn't want to. I told him he'd better be able to face his god one day and answer for what he'd done. He said he'd keep that in mind. And then he was gone. By the time I'd cooled off, months had passed. One morning it dawns on me that my brother always knew better than me. If he was so sure of what he was doing, then I should be there with him. I packed my things and was on the road that same morning. Of course, what I didn't know then was he'd already changed his mind. 
By that time, he was dead on that field. Crossed my mind. You live in a place like Gilded Vale. You don't have a whole lot else to do other than think about things you don't want to think about. I hope that wasn't it. I hope he went there because it's what he thought was right. But it seems I'm not meant to know. Still one more mess we gotta straighten out. Come on, then. I still owe you one. Right. Anyone here in Echo? of this place. I would have brought a torch if you'd asked. We light our own path now, Watcher. I don't suppose you could make a few bridges the same way, hmm? Can you do that again? I, I had something in my eye. I missed most of it. You understand the value of a mystery watcher, a buried scroll, a hidden truth. These are my ways. You unravel a thread watcher, one you have lost and discovered over generations. And following it to its end has only brought you back to the beginning. Nebula of souls, blind and brimming with potential. The answer to Woodica's question at the beginning of yours. What would you do with them?
In a way. But something must be done, and hurling them from the machinery of other schemes is the truest course of action. No end, Watcher. That is the purpose. None know. They could end up anywhere in the realms of gods or mortals, whole or divided. Discovering them again and charting their course through the ether will be a new mystery. That is a word for endings, and this is but a crossroads. Even I do not know what you would choose. I'm here. Right. Ready to take the oath to spread the word of the gods to the lost and heathen. I am trusting you to remain loyal to the gods in this. If you do not, you will have greater powers than me to answer to. But you will answer to me as well. I wouldn't ask this were there any other choice. This is a missionary, same as I was, taught the wrong things as I was. Asionis. They have held off many would-be invaders.
You are ready to give a confession? I'm ready to hear one from you. You are far from your post, Inquisitor. What brings you here? We are in a sanctum holy to Woodica. There are others like it in service to the other gods. I come here often to pray for her counsel, and in this space I may be assured that she hears me. That woman sought only to destroy the foundations of peace and civility that my people sacrificed everything to build. It has many uses, but its purpose is to bring structure to the chaos that surrounds it. They are monuments to Woodica's greatest servants among my people. I hope to join them myself one day. But my work is not yet complete. The Inquisition was based on the need to cut the flesh from a rotting wound. What is a god? Hmm? A higher power? A rewarder of good deeds and punisher of the wicked. Something men can turn to in their darkest moments when their days seem only like bridges from one tragedy to the next. Our gods are all these things. We are in a sacred place within earshot of the gods themselves. This is not the time. You've been through much these past few months. You will return home and you will rest. When you feel you have recovered, you may rejoin us at the trials. The Inquisition is far from over, and I will have need of you. There are many who continue to spread the lies of the apostate. The Inquisition will not end until we have pronounced judgment on all of them. How did you find it? Another in a string of acts of petty defiance. For all her knowledge, she always preferred spite over reason. Then she should have obeyed. I ask one thing of all my followers. She was incapable. A waste of rare talent and intellect. What of your cohorts, then? They have followed you to their deaths. Is it loyalty that brings them here? Or is it as my agents suggest, that they have no direction of their own? You. You worshipped Aethus, did you not? Your spies are good. What gave me away? The cape? Yet when your god needed you the most, you chose your country. We were being invaded. Not by anyone who was acting like a god. Then I should think your hometown gave you a hero's welcome when you returned. They made cake. Hard to blame people for losing faith when it's the gods who are misbehaving. The gods argue over how best to prevent Kith society from destroying itself. These disruptions would not be necessary were mortal instinct not so diseased. You built a weapon that delivered exactly as promised. I served my goddess as you did yours. Yet the other builders were slain. Eleven of a dozen. Why not you? Were you somehow different? Redeemable in your god's sight? Whatever desire I had to be redeemed in her eyes was weakness. 
purged by the Watcher's sight. Or was it merely that your goddess wanted you dead as well, and your delusions of importance prevented you from seeing the obvious? A whore's beguiling charms, nothing more. But the spell's broke now, Theos. The trial's over. I know friend from foe. And I've come here now to see a foe repaid. You were able to destroy a god because another god wished it. Without her hand to guide you, you could not strike at a god any more than you could strike the sky. You are impotent, and not just from the pox. You are far from home, dwarf. I knew my hunt would send me a long way from Masuk. It was a challenge I was glad to undertake for my village. A journey, then. It must be of some import to take you so far and to last so long. Anything worth doing comes at great cost. So it was worth it, then, to tell a dying beast of things it neither understood nor had memory of. A murderer given life beyond her body. Beyond her own selfish purpose. My dear, you embody the very reasons Kith should not play with the tools of the gods. Last I checked, it was your gods who set us up to destroy each other. Your city was spared by a god. It was destroyed by Kith, who took matters into their own hands. Such are the excesses my order seeks to correct. By tearing the souls out of little babies? That's some strong medicine. Strong and lasting, the way it must be. We do not indulge the whims of bloodlust as you do. All we do is for the sake of a cure. And the lost gift bearer. You have been many things in this life, all because you fear what you really are. I know what I am, and it's the searching that got me there. But it was the promise of redemption that led you down that course. Where would you be if you thought all was lost? What a pity. You must not think much of people if you feel like we're all so hopeless. Or perhaps I have merely witnessed the alternative. You are here because you are lost. The gods cannot reach everyone, I'm afraid. May you fare better in your next lives. I gather you have had your soul awakened. Why else would you shadow my footsteps like some stray mongrel? You think I have something to offer you, but our business was concluded long ago. You think your abilities only flow in one direction. That isn't how it works, I'm afraid. Not for me. For all that you saw of my soul in the sanitarium, I saw as much of yours. I answered your questions once. That your soul is not fit to accept the answers is of little concern to me. I lied to no one. Not to you, not to anyone. The gods are real. They are everything we need them to be, and the world is better for it. The heart of this country has skipped a beat. Nothing more. I have done far worse. I plunged the peaceful kingdom of Telosus into civil war. I slew the monarch of Desantio, whose people never knew hardship under his rule, and replaced him with a cruel despot who brought them to ruin. When plague arrived at the great city of Arborensis, I saw to it that the cure did not. They piled their dead outside the city in heaps that rose above their walls. That's where you are mistaken. There was a time, back when your soul was still a shapeless mist, when the world believed only in false gods. Thousands of them. Gods that told them to take slaves. Gods that told them to make war upon their neighbors and devour the slain. Gods that told them to burn their children alive and cover themselves in the ashes as a sign of their faith. But all that changed when they learned of the true gods. Our gods. All those misshapen, bestial instincts melted beneath the radiance of our gods' majesty. You could see it in their eyes. That dull emptiness replaced with the glimmer of a kindled spark and replaced it with one far worse. Had you imagined this existence? 
the one the apostate would have created. We are not all so virtuous as she. Without our gods, the most wicked, the most tyrannical, they would take that power for themselves. But more than that, it would be a hollow existence. All mysteries forever unanswered. All purposes constructed from meaninglessness. No endings to bring closure. Only a wheel, turning without mercy, grinding our spirits to dust. For all my years, I have seen exactly what they are capable of. What the apostate asked was beyond any man. All I have seen, the millennia of experience. I will not be dissuaded from this course. This is the only way. We are all controlled by our own doubts. Better that we should be relieved of them. With your soul and thousands of others, I will see this world purged of its suffering. Hear me, Woodica. Your servant calls for aid. Croak ten! <laughs> That's the servant down, and the mistress still to go. A good start, worthy of being built upon. After journeying for lifetimes, I can't imagine his failure, knowing it was all for nothing. Some point, you have to look at the things your god is telling you to do, and ask yourself if it's worth it. Think he got sick of it all after a couple thousand years? Or did Woodica keep him on the leash? Mmm, can't help but feel sorry for him. To live so long without a fresh start, with no chance to wonder what's around the corner. apply the teachings of Durance would more immediately satisfy the cravings in my bones. But this is the stronger lesson, for his soul is already marked by his own hand.
Never thought I'd see something like this in my travels. Lends a little perspective, doesn't it? To think, the decisions the Anguithans made thousands of years ago still shape our lives today. It would be a shame to deny these souls the chance to find their own way and their own purpose. I guess that's up to you, isn't it? Because I'm too short to reach the controls on that thing. For all I know, when you flip the switch, that thing will blast us all as far as Nazi talk. Whatever happens, though, I'm glad we journeyed together. So you did. It's been an honor. Ah, oh, the end of the road greets us at last. You fared well, Watcher. Better than any Watcher has right to. Seems you were a field in need of a flame's cleansing. Would that my own trial had produced such an outcome. I had figured myself for the field all this time. But you were the field, and I the darkness. A lesson neither of Durance nor of Margarin. But with that trial's end, a new one begins. A god's trial. And I will stand in judgment without mercy. Theus, he had hold of your soul from a long time back, seems like. You get what you needed from him? Well, those can be hard to come by, but maybe that's best. Forces you to find your own footing. You'll be feeling better soon, then. Good. <laughs> that's real good. You got it figured out what you're going to do about all that? Got a lot of people out there thinking they've been abandoned by their gods. There's not much that'll put the fear in you more than that. You can take my word for it. If it was in my power, and, and I know it's not, but if it was, I'd find a way to give them the courage to face it. Not because they think there's some god looking out for them, but because they've just got it in them. And after what you've been through, though, I'm sure you got your own ideas. Better make it good. You know something of quiet servitude, Watcher. Groveling and simpering before the gods whose aid you need, so that when they finally raise you to a place of power, you can seize what you desire. You have labored at the pleasure of others, that shriveled hag in Hadrat House, those preening soldiers with more taste for silk than steel, the wretched tribesmen playing out their fantasies of grandeur. And then you cowered and knelt before the gods themselves, begging one paltry favor and receiving riddles and visions in response. And now the gods give you orders and commands, even while you set out to fix what they cannot. Yet what have they offered you? The Exiled Queen is not an ungrateful patron. Finish the work Theos began. Strengthen Woodica with these souls and allow her to become the most powerful of all the gods, with you as her favored.
You say that now, but when you're standing in front of the machine, considering the lifetimes and the powers that await you, we'll see what you do. At your command, the ancient device became your instrument, spinning to life with deafening resonance and gathering up the swirling essence like thread on a great spindle. There, in the pale pulsing glow of the machine that set you on this path long ago, you summoned all your strength, focusing on your objective and blocking out all else. With a single concussive blast that rocked the chamber and sent you tumbling to the ground, you freed the souls from their stasis. Exhausted, your consciousness slipping away, your last sight was of the machine, dark and dormant. Then your eyes closed, and sleep welcomed you at long last. After coming to and searching for some time, you discovered the route Theos used to enter Sun in Shadow, and embarked on a long and arduous ascent back to the surface. You emerged in Ter Evron after days of tunneling through the rubble Theos had left behind, and when you stepped into the daylight, you were faced with a different Deerwood than the one you had left. At your direction, the lost souls of the Hollowborn were funneled back into the churn of Bareth's wheel to find their way into new vessels and partake in the life they had been denied during Whitewind's legacy. Though parents of Hollowborn would remain just that, the end of Whitewind's legacy would bring about a spate of new, healthy births, with many of the infants bearing souls once meant for hollowborn children. The natural cycle of life and death had been restored to Deerwood, and with it came a renewed faith in the providence of the gods. Lord Radric's zeal had brought him back to life once, but it would not do so again. Radric's destruction at your hands spelled the end of his suffocating rule over Gilded Vale and the surrounding area. In his absence, the village prospered, becoming a popular destination for new settlers anxious to leave Defiance Bay after the riots. Without a nearby ruler, it also grew more wild, with many settlers moving on as soon as they'd arrived, turned off by lawlessness that was excessive even by Deerwooden standards. Nevertheless, Despite the challenges of living there, Gilded Vale had survived, and would continue to survive for the foreseeable future. Following the assassinations of Duke Avar Wolfgren and Lady Webb, Defiance Bay was thrown into political upheaval. In the ensuing weeks, the streets had become the domain of looters and blackguards. Few dared to step outside their own doors alone or unarmed. But order was soon re-established by the Knights of the Crucible, who, despite their depleted numbers, had gained favor in the public eye for their role in the unraveling of the conspiracy surrounding Widewind's legacy, and were quickly reinforced by returning forces from Fleetbreaker Castle. For the Knights, their resurgence marked a return to the tradition as well. Having seen firsthand the dangers presented by dabblers and animancy, the Order quickly abolished the practice internally preferring the familiarity of their hammers and forges to the uncertainties of Essence and Adra. Their identity rediscovered, the Knights suppressed their political aspirations and began once again to train their recruits in the art of blacksmithing, recapturing the post-revolutionary ideals of Deerwood and regaining the respect of its citizens as a result. 
The destruction of the machine atop Ter Noaneth spelled the end of the reanimated corpses in Heritage Hill. Though at first few were willing to venture into the abandoned district, it was soon cleaned out and rebuilt. The district's horrors still fresh in people's minds, it would be some time before it was fully repopulated. But eventually the lure of cheap prime land would all but erase the memory. The Duke's assassination at the apparent hands of an Enomancer had caused catastrophic rioting in the streets of Defiance Bay, and few Enomancers survived the first day. Many Deer Woodens took the end of Widewind's legacy as a sign, both that the gods did not approve of Enomancy, and that the purging of Enomancers in Defiance Bay had been enough to satisfy them. In time, their rage would subside, and a number of surviving Enomancers remained in and around Defiance Bay, often taking to the wilds to practice their science without repercussions. The town of Deerford had seen the last of the Cult of Scan. Dark rumors about the town's many curses quickly faded, and travelers soon returned. Abidun's renewal brought new vigor and purpose to a god long known for quiet, steady labor. Handicraft saw a revival in the Deerwood, and no smith wanted for an apprentice. Additionally, Abidun's restored interest in preservation led to redoubled efforts to survey Ingwithin ruins. Anamancers and craftsmen alike found much to study, but tensions with Er Glanfoth rose. As for Stalwart, the Battle of Caron's Scar only strengthened their resolve to unlock the mysteries of Durgan Steel and build new marvels with the White Forge. However, Stalwart's ambitions brought them into further conflict with the Raid Serens, as more and more impoverished communities gathered at the border and vowed to finish the work of the Iron Flail. It would be many generations before the region saw peace. The Flames That Whisper clan found a cautious peace with Stalwart, particularly once the villagers heard of the aid the ogres had offered against the Eyeless. The clan moved back into the Russet Wood, and as Stalwart grew in prestige, the villagers formed a tighter alliance with their ogre neighbors. Within a generation, ogre traders visited Stalwart, and village hunters were welcome in the Russet Wood. Harmka's death had brought the Devil of Carrick little satisfaction. In time, her taste for vengeance soured. What replaced it was a hunger to feel something, anything, new. Summer had thinned the snowpack twice over when she felt the joint at her elbow first begin to stiffen. She turned her back on the hopes of animancy and civilization and walked east. She pushed through the mountains, past Raid Ceres, and into the broad plains of Isha Middle. She had forgotten what it was like to simply journey, no goal or destination in mind. Though she felt nothing more than the steady thump of her feet on the road, the endless horizons and grassy meadows were new to her. She measured her time in the gradual rusting of her body and was satisfied. Her movements slowed, but so did the world around her. Waist-high grasses undulated and tacked in the wind as gradual as the tides. Sparrows and black jays made steady pilgrimages across the sky, each flap of their wings a solemn salute. She could hardly move when she found something she had never seen before, the ocean. With the last of her strength, she pulled herself beneath the water, content at last to feel the movement of currents and the constant caress of the waves. Sawa came to believe that the Takan had survived through him. He returned to Ishamital, where he united a number of small, vulnerable tribes under the beliefs of his people. He called them Takanakin, kin of Takan, and under his tutelage, they became strong enough to resist would-be conquerors. Zawa taught his secrets not to one chosen person, but to all, that the line of knowledge might never be broken. Once Maneha had made peace with her memory, she decided the time had come to face her more recent past. For the first time in decades, she returned home to Rawatai, and she found that it had changed as much as she had. New districts had sprung up along the coast, while others withered into crumbling husks, and the streets had changed their course as surely as rivers. 
Her parents wept with joy at her return. They still ran the old spice shop, and in its many aromas and flavors, she found memories of the places she'd traveled and the people she'd known. She told her story, bottle by bottle, and began to build a life on the soil she knew best. The fortress of Cadnua emerged as a bastion of security in the midst of an untamed land, becoming the envy of every thane and earl in Deerwood. Legend grew over time of its impregnability, and stories of formidable invaders easily scattered by the Keep's defenses became popular around the hearths of Deerwood Indians. Likewise, it also became a beacon to travelers, merchants, and visiting dignitaries alike. Reputed as the finest fortress in all Deerwood, people would journey from near and distant lands alike to experience its fabled hospitality and grandeur. After the death of the Master Below, a strange quiet fell over the endless paths of Ad Nua. The attacks on the fortress above ceased, Ad Nua's silent titan the closest remaining thing to a master in its musty, forgotten passages. Pelagina had gone against the Duke Spell's orders by inventing a new trade arrangement with the Anamenfath to accommodate the recovering Deerwood and Market. With the Deerwood's people still weakened by Widewind's legacy, the Valian Republics easily pushed their would-be competitors out of the market. For her outrageous insubordination and audacity, Pelagina was banished from the Republics. She traveled north in the Eastern Reach, avoiding Valian ports and entering the ranks of the kind wayfarers. Despite her bravery and dedication to those in her care, her strange appearance made her feel like an outsider wherever she went. Heravius took his leave of the party and, after his first bath in years, returned to his nomadic lifestyle. With his homesickness expunged, he found renewed joy and tranquility in his wandering survey of the wilderness. For the first time in his life, he ventured beyond sight of the mountains of Er Glonthath. During his travels, he penned numerous journals and sketches detailing his travels through frozen tundra, searing desert, and tropical forests. Wherever he went, Heravius left behind stories of the Autumn Druid, a temperamental one-eyed wise man of the forest, known to bring food to lost travelers and unusual advice to anyone willing to ask him a question. Adair chose not to return home to Gilded Vale. Still most comfortable far from cities, he settled in Deerford, which, like many towns in the Deerwood, was beginning the slow process of rebuilding. Believing now that it was the obligation of Kith to be the leaders their gods had not, Adair was soon named mayor of the town, and under his guidance, Deerford soon began to prosper. He expelled the last of the Scanites from the area and drew new settlers with the offer of land, a trick he had learned from someone he otherwise preferred to forget. With each passing day, Deerford would come to more closely resemble the gilded veil of Adair's childhood, the one worthy of its name. When the dust settled in sun and shadow, Aloth looked upon the remains of Theos Ixarchanon, his former master. He saw where the Grand Master had gone wrong and what would be required to undo the harm Theos had wrought. With a flick of his wrist, he burned Theos's robe, headdress, and every other symbol of the man's power. Never again, he vowed, should Kith live in fear and blind obedience to an authority they did not understand. Armed with the knowledge and courage he had gained on his journeys with the Watcher, he set out on the long and lonely task of dismantling the Leaden Key. With the Watcher's goals accomplished and his own vows fulfilled, Kanorua sailed back toward Rawatai, thinking on the lessons his travels had provided him. By the time he landed at Tekoa, he understood what his path must be. Standing before the Lore College, Kanorua explained that the tablet he sought had been destroyed, and so a true interpretation of the Tonvi Oratoa could no longer exist. The people of Rawatai would have to create their own. He described the many strange things he had seen in his travels, and announced his intent to pursue the accumulation of knowledge abroad, seeking answers to new questions. True to his word, Kana soon set sail on yet another expedition, and in Tekoa, his passionate accounts inspired many to follow in his footsteps. With Theos defeated and the souls released from sun and shadow, 
healthy children were born once again in the Deerwood. The grieving mother sought a place where she might do penance for the birthing bell. She returned to Deerford, where, to the astonishment of the villagers, she delivered the first healthy child in over a decade. She remained there, and with each new birth, she saw a measure of hope restored to the Deerwood and a measure of grace for her own troubled past. Durrance used Magrin's strength only until Theos had been cast from the world and then swore off her influence entirely. Regret came to weigh heavily on his mind, and a man who had never previously lacked for words or opinions came to embrace silence and contemplation. He continued to wander, penniless and destitute, searching now not for the reason for his goddess's silence, but for a mechanism for revenge. The charred robes he continued to wear as a reminder that he had been burned by his goddess, and not just by the flames of the godhammer. Sagani experienced the four months of her journey back to Masuk in vivid colors. She strove to memorize every moment of her final trip through the Deerwood, Erglonfoth, the Valian Republics, and beyond, preparing to tell her village of what she had seen on her long journey. All of Masuk shared in her triumph, and she felt her pride and elation magnified by the joy of her village. Never again did she doubt the value of her sacrifices. After decades as a long hunter, Sagani finally became one of Masuk's most respected elders. She guided her community with wise counsel, and a generation after she finally passed, another huntress journeyed into the world to find her soul. For you, the death of Theos brought an end to your waking visions and a silence to the whispers of the past. In their absence, you were able to sleep. The questions of a distant lifetime ceased to trouble your soul. All that remained was what to make of the answer. But at the moment, there was little to be done, and the matter would have to wait. A long journey loomed ahead, made no easier by your decision to bring an infant to Sun and Shadow. <laughs>